intentional energetic presence is exactly what it sounds like, as in, you know, being intentional about the energetic presence you bring to everything you do and to everyone you interact with. And so, you know, I, when I walk into a room, um, am I being intentional about how I show up and the energy I'm bringing into that room? When I sit down to do my taxes, am I being intentional about the way that I'm showing up even with myself? Hmm. You know, when I'm with my child, is, is, what's my level of intentionality? And the other piece of this is if you break those three things down, if you break it down into intention, energy, and presence, your intention is what you want to have happen. Your energy is the energy and the stamina, your well-being in order to make those things happen. And then your presence is really how you're showing up while you're making those things happen, how present you are with that human being, how present you are to your life, um, you know, bas- basically just the all-encompassing of how are you showing up. So you're a smart business committed to innovation, to service, and to modern marketing. And you're asking, what's next? Wondering how you can become even more innovative. My name is Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and this is the InnovaBuzz podcast, where we share all kinds of tips, advice, and interview guests on all things innovation and leadership in modern marketing. Hi, innovators. It's great to be back. I hope you've had an awesome week so far. I'm coming to you today from the beautiful main island of Vanuatu in Port Vila, about to start our first Fast Business Mastery Summit for 2018. That's definitely exciting. And I love the weather here. It's 25 degrees. There's a little bit of rain around, but it's definitely better than the winter down in my home in Lara near Geelong. Now I'm really stoked to have on the Innova Buzz podcast as my guest today, Anise Kavanagh, the creator of the IEP method that stands for Intentional Energetic Presence, and she's also the author of the book Contagious Culture. Anise and I had a lot of fun discussing the presence reboot, how you can quickly reset your mindset to be fully and energetically present in any situation. We talked about effective leadership and the key components that are required for that. And we talked about how choosing our response to situations and choosing our state gives us personal power and the ability to have great impact. Without further ado, then Let's fly into the hive and get the buzz from Anise Kavanagh. Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast today from Rockland, California, near Sacramento, Anise Kavanagh, who's the creator of the IEP method, and she'll explain that to us in a moment the author of Contagious Culture, the book, and she's a speaker and a leadership advisor. So welcome to the podcast, Denise. It's a privilege to have you here. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It is a pleasure to be here. Mike Ganino, who was on episode 114, introduced me to Anise and suggested we interview you on the podcast. So a big hello to Mike. Oh, hi, Mike. (laughs) That's so good. I love that. (laughs) Thank you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So your book and the IEP method talk about how energy impacts, how our energy impacts other people in the world and, and that how we show up and how we are being impacts our leadership influence. So I'd like to explore that a little bit more with you today and I'd like to hear your thoughts also about how that method might be applied to the online space. Oh, now, absolutely. Be- now before we do that though, let's find out about you a little bit more as a person. So as a young child, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, I wanted, what did I want to be? I wanted to work in a very tall skyscraper in New York City. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew that I wanted to work in a very tall building when I was little. Okay. Did you ever get to realize that dream? You know, I did. I got to realize that dream in San Francisco and then go to New York a lot. But, um, but I realized that dream and that dream was fun. And then I decided to do other stuff. So, yes. Yeah. So how did you end up where you are today? Uh, you know, I started, so when I was younger, when I was a little girl, I wanted to work in the tall skyscrapers. Um, I'm not even sure why that was. I just, it was just a thing I had. However, as I started to get older, when I was about 13, 14 years old, 
I became really interested in how people made things happen in the world. I am, um, at the time, I didn't know that I was interested in leadership, but now looking back, I can see I was really interested in leadership and impact and how did self-care tie into all of that and just basically how did, you know, what made, what made people do things. And um, as I grew up, I started studying, when I went to school, I studied kinesiology in school, and that was um, athletic training and clinical exercise and working with athletes, and loved that, got obsessed with human performance, and then went and worked in corporate America for a while, doing work with human performance and health and productivity, and then I went and I worked in the fitness industry for a while, um, especially in corporate, corporate well-being. Um, worked with some in the healthcare industry, just, you know, kind of like a little bit like Goldilocks, just continuing to look at the mm. different things that really, really felt good to me. And uh, very, very long story short, I had my first baby and decided I was never going to work again and took a year off and just was completely devoted to being a stay-at-home mom and being with this little guy. Like, you could not pull me away from this kid. And about a year into that, that kind of the oxytocin wore off. <laughs> and I really missed my career. <laughs> so um, so I, I, you know, basically took everything that I love doing from working with athletes to working in corporate to health and productivity to healthcare to um, the fitness industry to like all these different pieces. And while my son was taking a nap and I was waiting for him to wake up in the parking lot of my gym, um, I started to craft what ultimately became this business on Post-its. I just crafted all the things that I love doing in my career, the things that I love doing with the athletes, with the doctors, with the executives, and basically created a job out of it, a J-O-B. And my criteria for the J-O-B was that it had to be something that was meaningful enough and purposeful enough for me um, that would make me feel like a better person um, out in the world, you know, that would warrant basically me being willing to leave my, my children. Um, and so that became a new job. There was nobody that was hiring for that job, hmm. and so I created a company out of it. And, yeah. and then the rest is kind of history. It just started to grow from there. Yeah, I, I love that story. And I think um, when I heard you tell it on another podcast, you mentioned that um, one of the things about starting your own business with that job description was it did give you the other option of spending more time with your children or with, with your son at the time that, yeah. than you would have if you had been employed. Yeah, I think, so. I, I, I think it did. You know, it's funny. It's, it's, um, I, probably, I probably worked almost just as much at the beginning. I just worked more creatively, you know. Mm. So I, I would work when he was in um, with his babysitter or in childcare. I would work or he would be napping. I would work. So I, I remember I always had 9 till 12 o'clock when he was little was my time nine until 12 o'clock. I knew I was guaranteed those hours. And so that would be time when I would schedule sessions with, with clients or any, anything that I needed to do on somebody else's schedule. That was when I would do it. And then the rest of it, I would work around him. So I might write or work on marketing copy or, you know, all the stuff that you can do behind the scenes I would do while he was sleeping or um, when he didn't need my attention. And so I, 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 you know, I can remember getting up in the morning, sometimes at four o'clock in the morning, because it was the t only time that I could find that, that I wouldn't be interrupted over and over and over again. So mm. yeah, I think, it, I think you get creative. I think you just get really creative when you're very connected to something you want to make happen. Yeah. And that's what I did. Yeah. But the other thing that strikes me about that story is that you were living that intentional energetic presence there because you spoke about, you know, the time where you'd focus on your client or your business and, and mm -hmm. then the other times, you know, the business and clients had to wait because that's when you were focused on your, your son and family. Gosh, you know, that's, you're right. That's true. I have never, ever thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. I, um, at that time, IEP, Intentional Energetic Presence, I had not created that methodology yet. Um, however, I think it was ingrained in me. I think that it mm. was, you know, it's the reason why it got created probably, right, it was because I kind of swam in it. Um, but you're absolutely right. And, I, and, and thank you for saying that because that's a, that just made my mouth water a little bit just thinking about how <laughs> that, probably is, that probably is how I was able to do as much as I did when he was little um, and being really able to be intentional take care of myself and then to be incredibly present with him. So thank you for that. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So tell us a little bit more about the IEP method then, intentional energetic presence, because maybe people are wondering why we're, <laughs> why we're going off on that tangent. But to me, that wasn't a tangent at all. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's not a tangent. It's um so so well a little bit of backdrop to just to give people context around IEP is so where when I started my business, I again was obsessed with human performance and started working with a lot of business leaders. And when I worked with these business leaders and their teams, um what I what I began to notice is they always wanted to work on the skills. You know, they always wanted to work on uh, you know, feedback, communication, strategy, business, all these different things that are super, super important. However, uh, what I found was that the skills could only take them so far. And I started to recognize that 9 out of 10 people that came to me for work to be more impactful leaders and to start to create better culture, nine, about 90% of them that were coming, it wasn't their skills. It wasn't about what they were doing. It was mm. about how they were showing up. It was something to do with their presence. It was something to do with their intentionality. Um, they were burning out potentially. Their personal relationships were suffering. You know, people worked with them because they were really skilled, but they didn't necessarily like working with them because of the way they made them feel. And so a lot of the stuff I started to notice was not anything in their skill set as much as their state of being, their presence, their, the quality of intention that they brought to everything that they did. So um, I, you know, as I unfolded this thing and continued to, to grow this work, um, I distilled it down to a methodology, which basically is the IEP method, which stands for intentional energetic presence. And intentional energetic presence is exactly what it sounds like, as in, you know, being intentional about the energetic presence you bring to everything you do and to everyone you interact with. And so... You know, I, when I walk into a room, um, am I being intentional about how I show up and the energy I'm bringing into that room? When I sit down to do my taxes, am I being intentional about the way that I'm showing up even with myself? Mm. You know, when I'm with my child, is, is, what's my level of intentionality? And the other piece of this is if you break those three things down, if you break it down into intention, energy, and presence, your intention is what you want to have happen. Your energy is the energy and the stamina, your well-being in order to make those things happen. And then your presence is really how you're showing up while you're making those things happen, how present you are with that human being, how present you are to your life, um, you know, bas- basically just the all-encompassing of how are you showing up. And, you know, the, 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 the realization of the body of work and the realization of what was happening with my clients, it was kind of happening and unfolding at the same time. Because what I realized was no matter how many beautiful skills I could give a client, if their IEP was not supporting them, if they were burnt out, if they weren't being intentional, if they were leaving dead bodies everywhere they went, I could be the most brilliant skill giver in the world and their skills were only going to take them so far. So in 2009, my whole company said, okay, no more skills. We're actually going to focus on bringing this idea of intentions, energy, and presence to the world and looking at this being the underlying thing that's happening all the time, no matter how, no matter what skills you're bringing. Mm. So that's, that kind of gives you a little bit of a backdrop. Okay. And I mean, I can relate very much to the, um, from my corporate days in particular, to okay. the area where the focus was so much on skill and then, you know, some really skillful people were, um, oh, basically they were a, nightmare to work with um, yeah but like you say people work with them and they got to where they got because of the skills that they had um but they didn't you know they well they did have an energetic presence but it was kind of having a negative energy it was draining energy on other people and and yeah it was probably a lack of balance in some of the other areas that you mentioned oh yeah and, and you know and i love and you're and you're bringing up a really important point because we all have an energetic presence and we can use it for good or evil, right? Mm. So, you know, being intentional, and that's why the book is called Contagious Culture, because being intentional about the energetic presence I bring, I can I can have a positive energetic presence or, a, you know, something that adds to the field and adds to people feeling inspired and adds to the quality of um, the environment, or I can bring an energetic presence in that actually is soul-sucking and you know, leaves people not inspired and careful and all that good stuff. So, you know, one of the things that I noticed was this thing I call the leadership trifecta. And in the book, there's a, there's a chapter on this, but the leadership trifecta, I started to notice that 
there were three different kinds of business leaders that would come to this work. And by the way, when I say business leaders, I'm talking about human beings, no matter Mm -hmm. what level of business they're in. So it didn't matter if they were the CEO or if they were a teacher or a doctor or a stay-at-home parent. I find these things apply to all of us. So I use the word leader as in human leader, but we're speaking specifically to business. So I'll I'll stay in there. Um, But what I noticed with business leaders was there was the first kind who had phenomenal impact, great results, you know, you know, was a high performer, made good money for the company. Maybe they're a great designer, great, you know, they're great at their craft, whatever it might be. However, they were absolutely exhausted and burnt out. Their health is deteriorating. They're gaining weight. They're not taking care of themselves. Their relationships are falling apart. They're missing their kids. Their marriages are, you know, in trouble, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you get the picture. And, mm. you know, with, with that kind of a leader, they've got the impact piece down. However, it's not sustainable from a self-care and a, um, and a life perspective. So that, that was one kind of a leader. Then there was another kind of a leader that would come and they had great self-care, you know, work nine to five, great work-life balance, their chakras are in alignment, they're eating good food every day, they go to yoga, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. However, they were not very effective at making things happen. So they were lacking in uh, either the leadership presence or the leadership skill in order to create impact. And so, you know, now we're looking at, you know, in one part of the trifecta is the ability to create impact. The second part of the trifecta is the ability to take care of yourself, so self-care, and um, you really need both of those. But then what I found was that there was a third kind of leader that they would have great impact and results, great self-care, however, they left dead bodies everywhere they went. Hmm. So, you know, they, they were the ones that people, uh, as soon as they would walk into the room, people would get careful. When people would find that they were working with them on the team, there would be contraction around it. They were the leaders that um, got the results and, you know, took care of themselves, but it was at the expense of the human beings that were working with them on their teams or the human beings that were following them. And so these were the leaders that people followed because they had to, not because they wanted to. And as I took this apart a little bit more, this leadership trifecta, I found that we need to have our intentions in all three of these, they don't have to be perfect, but we want to have awareness in doing the best we can to nourish each of them in order to have optimal impact over time. Hmm. Yeah, I really like the model from the point of view of the balance in all the, oh, excuse me, in all those areas, and um, certainly the you know those archetype leaders that you've just described um, saw a lot of those in the corporate world, and um, you know the. In considering your model and, and thinking about what you've just said, it kind of explains a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, go ahead. You also mentioned something, and I'd like to explore this a moment, um, about how we have impact on others, you know, whether we're in a leadership position or whether we're just on a team or something. And I was in a um, training workshop um, a couple of weeks ago where one of the participants turned up on one day and obviously had something going on outside the training room, you know, something on his mind and was essentially just occupying space there but not contributing or participating and and by doing that was really impacting on everybody else. Now, it was totally unconscious, um, although everybody else was conscious of the impact it had. So, you know, talk to us a little bit about the unconscious impact we have on on people and, and bringing that uh, IEP thinking into our conscious awareness. Oh, so. absolutely. I, well, I love, I love this topic. I love this conversation because I think that there's probably not a single person listening to this who's not had the experience of being in the room with the lowest vibration in the room. Mm. So I, I call what you're talking about, I call that the lowest vibration in the room. Um, and the rule is that the lowest vibration will win unless there are other people in the room who are really good at holding their own energetic state. Hmm. And how this can play out is, you know, to your point about the workshop participant, it can be really easy for people to feel that person's energy, even if they're not saying anything, but just the energetic presence they're bringing in. It can be very, very easy for the people around him or her to start getting hooked into that energy and to start to match that level of vibration. Um, You you, you know, I'm sure you've seen this in meetings. You walk into a meeting, 
you have eight people in the room, six of them are in really good space, they're excited to be there, and then there's those two people in the corner that are just arms crossed, sitting back, they're kind of naysaying everything, it just feels like they're devoted to sucking the life out of the room, they're devoted to, to, to tanking it. And what typically can happen is that the people that walked in that were in a really good space, those six, they start to match the energy of the lower vibration too. And then all of a sudden now you have a low vibration throughout the whole room. There's tension and people leave that meeting going, see, meetings are terrible. Mm. So that, so that, that's the danger of not being aware of your intentional energetic presence. Now, I, I don't want to make the guy or, the, or the, the woman or whoever it was in the room with you in the workshop. I don't wanna, it's never about making them wrong. It's just noticing where they're at energetically. And then for yourself, not getting hooked into that energy, you know, so I call it in the book, I talk about bubbling up and I, you know, I think about it as we all have our own space. So as soon as I'm in a room with somebody whose energy is really low or they're being a detractor to the field, what I do is I just, I simply bubble up and I hold that space and my job becomes as leader to stay in my own space, to not get sucked into whatever's going on for them, but to still hold compassion and curiosity and space for that person to kind of up level their own energetic state if they wish. So, yeah. you know, it, it, yeah. Yeah. That's really, really great advice. And, and to the credit of the person who was the trainer there, she did exactly that. And, you know, over the period of a f number of days, the um, energy of all the participants in, in that room was quite amazing, really. It's, sure. well, you know, well, you know, it's so um, it's such a good thing to bring up because I know this is some of the feedback that we get a lot of times when people go through, especially when they go through with their team and they do this workshop. We, we do two-day workshops on this content. And uh, one of the biggest things we've heard back is people will start to integrate these principles into their team meetings. And we've got one client who says that all they need to do is they check in at the beginning of the session or the beginning of the meeting, and they just check in with everyone. Where are you at energetically? Like zero to 10, how are you feeling? Hmm. And they have an agreement that a four is fine, a negative four is fine. You can be anywhere you want. It's just you want to be aware of it, and you want to be aware of your impact. And so that in itself can be a really beautiful way when you get into a group to just go, okay, how are you doing? Where are you at? Everyone, everyone claims their number. It gives them awareness. And the minute I've named where I'm at energetically, I've already started to shift. That's right, yeah. You know, and so there's that. And then the other thing that this, this you know, we and just un got this unconsciously point. that reinforces the point that wherever you're at, you're impacting others. So if you're yeah. at a 10, you're, you know, you're getting others excited. If you're at a minus four, you're kind of holding others back. Yeah, poten potentially, potentially. Mm. And, you know, but, but here's the thing. There's also real wisdom. So I've seen it where if... Um, you know, one, just asking someone how they are can help shift their state, you know, so with that, you know, I, I won't talk about your workshop participant anymore, but I'll just, I'll, I'll say George, um, <laughs> you know, if George, if George is in the room with me and I'm noticing George is really low vibe and it's having a negative impact on the room, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to hold my energetic state and, and hope and intend that he decides to shift out of it and join me where I'm at because presence begets more presence. So a lot of times that might be enough. If George doesn't shift, then I might ask George, hey, George, how are you doing? What's going on for you? Like you feel, you feel a little off. Is everything okay? That in itself might have George shift because now he's got some attention. I'm coming from a place of curiosity and not judgment or making mm. him wrong. You know, so that in itself might shift something. If nothing happens from that and George is you know, tanking the room, I might take a break and call a timeout and just say, hey, George, come talk to me and ask George what's going on and ask him if he's aware of the impact he's having in the room. Hmm. So there are three, you know, three levels of addressing that. Now, one of the things we've seen happen is if George is at a four and the team gives him permission and I as leader give him permission to be like, okay, you're at a four, George, I get it. Do you need anything? A lot of times that creates space for new wisdom. Yeah. And, you know, I saw this happen personally with the team where George was at a four and the team got curious and said, wow, what's going on for you? And George said, you know, this project we're heading into, I don't feel good about it. And here's why. And that changed the entire conversation and the project ended up being way, way better. Hmm. So if George had faked it and been like, oh, no, I'm at a 10, I'm good, like I'll get over it. And the team or the team had made him wrong for it, they would not have gotten to the ultimate outcome, which was way better results because they allowed for authentic energy and emotion in that room. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a, a great approach or a couple of great approaches there. So I really yeah. like that. Um, now, in terms of, so if I'm George <laughs> and, yeah. and I'm aware of that, I, I was interested to hear yesterday um, on one of the podcasts that I was listening to where you were interviewed about how you do a mindset shift. And it was funny because I'd been rushing to get something done the whole day and I was kind of getting a bit, uh, doing a little bit of overwhelm and then heading off to a meeting and, of course, last minute kind of thing and got stuck in traffic and was running a little late for the meeting. So when I got to the meeting and I had been listening to your podcast and I thought, now I'm, I'm in the wrong state here. So, <laughs> so I, did, I actually took your advice and did that mindset shift to, <laughs> to um, change my energy. Mm. <laughs> How'd it go? Yeah, it was fine. It worked. I mean, I, you know, I've I've done a lot of mindset shift stuff work in different space. So there's probably a lot of other stuff coming in when I do that. But I thought I liked the, your approach to that. So maybe you could explain that. <clears throat> sure. Are you are you talking about the energetic xylophone or are you talking about the reboot? Do you know the reboot? Yeah, the reboot. Okay, great. So, all right. So. So the way that I hold it is that shifting your state is really a matter of choice. It's just a decision. Mm. So the minute that I, the minute that I'm aware that I am not having the experience I want to have, or I'm not creating the experience I want to create, the minute I'm aware of that, I am now in awareness, which gives me a lot of power. And so now I have choice. So lack of awareness is what creates a lot of struggle. So a lot of times we walk around, we're so busy, we're just not aware, and then we're struggling with our day and our energy, and it's exhausting, and then we're having negative impact on people, and we don't even realize it because we don't have awareness. The minute I can breathe and go, oh, I am not feeling the way I want to feel right now. I am not creating the experience I want to create. Oh, gosh, people aren't responding to me in a way I would like them to respond. The minute I'm aware of that is the moment where I get to take a quick breath, or a deep breath, not a quick one, but a deep breath, and to kind of and to reboot my presence and go, all right, what is it I want to create here? So I talk about the presence reboot, and that's one of the three components of the IEP method. And the presence reboot is simply, you know, noticing where you're at, um, and then if it's not where you want it to be, setting an intention for how you'd like to show up instead. So I notice where I'm at. Part two is I set an intention for how I'd like to be and feel instead. Step three is I do whatever I need to do in that moment to take care of myself. So nine times out of ten, this is simply breathing or making a decision. Um, sometimes it's like, oh, God, I'm really exhausted. I need water. I need to use the bathroom. I need to say something. You know, it, it can be a lot of different things at number mm. three. But usually, nine times out of ten, it's breath. And then step four is I just become it. I become the next level of I, I choose to step into a new level of presence and a new state. And then five is just rinsing and repeating over and over and over again and just noticing when I lose presence because it's impossible to stay present all the time. So, you know, if you recap again, it's one, notice, two, intent, three, take care, four, step in, and five, reboot. Mm. And that's it. Yeah. And, and, you know, it's funny, Jurgen, because that's the, that's the five-step official training wheels, guardrails process. But really, once people start playing with it, even in this moment, if I notice that I'm not – feeling the way I want to feel, and I'm noticing I'm not present, and my presence isn't getting me what I want it to get me, or I'm not having the impact I want to have, I get to choose right now to breathe and to show up differently. So it's mm. a very quick reboot. The more we do it, the easier it becomes, and then the more we practice the other parts of the methodology, so the second part is building a really strong energetic field, which is really about self-care, um, and then the, fourth, the third part is uh, creating intentional impact. The more we build that strong energetic field, the easier it is to reboot authentically and not walk through life faking it until we make it. Yeah. yeah. But we have to build a strong field. Yeah. And I think, you know, you said something at the beginning there, and I think that that's key to um, this sort of technique is knowing that, you know, you have the choice how you show up, you have the choice how you feel. So in my example yesterday, um, you know, I was doing overwhelm. That was my choice. I mean, yeah. it, was, it wasn't a conscious choice. It was yeah. unconscious, but I became aware of it and thought, well, you know, I, I need to choose to do this differently. I need to choose to show up differently here to this meeting because otherwise I'm not going to have the impact I want to have. And that's, I think that's a 
critical part to realise that you do have choices in these things and then use some of those techniques to make the choice to shift things. I love that. I love that so much. I, I think one of the most dangerous things we can get into is the belief that things outside of us, other people, other things are creating our experience for us and mm. that we don't have control. Um, and, you know, how I hold that is we have control of nothing. I can't control what happens outside of myself. I can't control if you like me. I can't control how your audience receives this interview. I can't control, I can't control anything. But I can absolutely choose and control how I want to show up, how yeah. I want to breathe right now, how I want to be with you in this space. So I think, um, I think that sometimes it's just that, that quiet decision going, all right, right now I feel really stressed out. Uh, I'm going to choose to feel a little bit more expansive and just to breathe right now and see if that creates a different result for me and my system. So, mm. that, so we do have control over that. And I think that's really, I think that's, that's one of our God-given superpowers that we just forget about because we get so busy. Yeah, yeah. And the other superpower that's related to that is attaching some meaning to the things that you can't influence. So I think there's a saying that <laughs> says, um, you know, God give me the strength to yeah. change the things that I can change. Now, I can't remember exactly how it goes. Change the things I can change, accept the things I can't change. And what was the third one? Understand have the difference. The or, yeah, yeah, have, have the, the wisdom, wisdom to know the yeah. difference. But, yeah. you know, beyond that is attaching meaning to something which then um, triggers, well, that's sort of a choice because then you choose to feel that, oh, so and so gave me a shifty look so he doesn't like me right um right you know so that he doesn't like me well even the shifty look was is is a a meaning because it might have just been a quizzical look or it might have been a totally different look so i've attached meaning to the look and then i've attached meaning to what to a secondary meaning to the look as well and then i choose to feel bad about that so <laughs> Oh, yeah. And, and that's so, I mean, let's be honest, that's so easy to do. That's mm. so easy to, that's so easy to do to, to forget, you know, to start to make up stories in our minds about what something means. And the thing is, it's all made up. Yeah. <laughs> like, and there's no way, there's no way I can possibly know what that guy's facial expression with me looks like, or even what he just said. I can, there's no way I can possibly understand what his intentions were, you know? So I, so I want to check myself before I start to assign meaning and make up stories around it because most likely in my experience human beings tend to choose the more negative story mm. than the more positive one so i joke around and say don't make assumptions at all don't assign meaning but if you must assign meaning that assign meaning that supports you you yeah. know assign meaning that makes you feel happy and expansive and it's going to help you show up in a way that uh you know has you potentially have more impact than than not it doesn't always work but at mm. least at least set yourself up beautifully with with fake good meaning if you're going to do <laughs> yeah yeah and some of that it occurs to me that some of that is part of the taking care of yourself because if you assign the worst possible meaning to things you observe outside um is that a sign that you know you you're actually got a you've you doubt yourself you've got bad feelings about yourself and and so you know that's not taking care of yourself yeah potentially i think you know i think when i look at the self-care component that that second um step of the methodology you know we look at your physical and your environmental energy so physically speaking how you're taking care of yourself the food you're eating your sleep um your environment you know does your environment really support you if, if you say that you um really want to you have a ton of energy and vitality and then I come over for dinner tonight and your house is loaded with donuts and ho-hos and um, <laughs> you're smoking and you're not taking care of it. Like your environment's not supporting you. And so, you know, the first part we look at is your physical and environmental energy. Then we look at your mental and emotional energy and the mental and emotional is what you and I are talking about right now, which is the assumptions you assign, the, the meaning that you assign, the assumptions you make, the beliefs you hold. Um, and self-kindness is in here. This is, this is something that Oh gosh, if, if there, you know, there's a lot of stuff I want to do with this work in the world, but one of the things is this idea around self-kindness and really making self-kindness be something to uh, be celebrated and as important of a leadership skill as anything else that we do. It's the ability, you know, the ability to be kind to ourselves and to notice when we're being critical, when we're making ourselves wrong, when we're being hard on ourselves, because 
in my experience, that is not super productive at all, and it's contracting energy, and it's exhausting, and then you just start this negative spiral. So self-kindness goes in that second quadrant as well. Hmm. All right. Well, this is – yeah. This is really fascinating. I could go and talk for ages about this, but I'm conscious of the time. So I think it's time we move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round designed to help our audience. And they're primarily innovators and leaders in their field. So this is highly relevant um, with some tips from your experience. So I've got five questions and hopefully you'll give us something really insightful to inspire people and help them do something awesome. Oh, good. I, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing is, what, what's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Uh, be present and take care of themselves. Mm. I got to give you two. Yeah. To, me, to, me those, to me, those two go together. So I would say if I can only have one, I'm going to say um, being absolutely present to the self-care that you need. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Really good. <laughs> Well, I think you've covered covered that being present involves a lot of those factors anyway, so it's it sort does. of all encompassing. Well, it, it, and it's just it's just from from a place of presence. And if I am taking care of myself and operating on all cylinder, cylinders, I have got access to a lot more creativity and innovation than if I'm mm. running around burnout. You can't innovate from burnout. You just yeah. I mean you can, but not as well. So that that's 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 the yeah. rationale for my answer. Yes. And, and there's a lot of people that kind of believe that, okay, I've got to take care of other people first. And, you know, this plays out in families where somebody's looking after a sick person or a sick child in particular, um, or it plays out in the workplace where there's kind of the, the rescuer, um, persecutor, mm-hmm. um, pro, um, archetypes playing out. Um, and, and I love the analogy where you know if you're in an aircraft and they do the safety briefing they say you know if you're traveling with a small child and the oxygen mask drops down put on your your oxygen mask first before you help the small child and you know that's kind of initially to those people that are in that mindset they think well that's wrong um but it's not wrong and the purpose is if you pass out because of lack of oxygen then you're no good to the small child so the first mm-hmm. thing is take care of yourself so that you can help the child. Absolutely. I, hmm. I, I agree with that. I agree with that so strongly. I, uh, you know, I look at a lot of times people uh, will look at self-care as selfish. I look at it as self-full. Hmm. And being self-full enables me to give more to other people. So I know for a fact that if my self-care, if I let my self-care slip, I know for a fact that I do not have the same amount of love and attention and energy and all that stuff to give to other people. The more I nourish my self-care, the more quote unquote selfish I am, the more I am able to go out and do more with my life and more in service of everybody else. Hands down, no doubt about it. I would, this is, this is, this is one of the main reasons why this work got created was for the stand I take for self-care. All right. Yeah. So I'm with you on the airplane. (laughs) (laughs) So what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Hmm. Uh, let's see. That's a great, I love that question. Best thing I've done to develop new ideas. Um, I would say that it's a combination of everything we just talked about with staying really in tune to what do I feel? What do I sense a need for? You know, what is, what is my, what, what is my, like really tuning into what is my desire for what's missing? And then also what do I see as missing for other people? So using my intuition and then just discernment to kind of notice like what doesn't feel good. I, I find like, um, I find that, you know, underneath every complaint is an uncommunicated request. So a lot of times if I have a complaint about something, all I have to do is look at the request I have underneath it. And sometimes there's a new idea of something that needs to be creative. Mm. Um, and then I would add that to, I surround myself with really, really brilliant people, people who are way smarter than me at some of these things. And then I take ideas to them and I go, what do you think about this? And then we chop it up and tear it apart. And um, I might come out with just a little morsel of what the original idea was, but it's usually a pretty good morsel. Yeah. Yeah, great, great yeah. strategy. And you know, listening to, uh, I like the behind every complaint there is an uncommunicated request because you know how often do you hear "stop complaining"? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So absolutely. listening to listening to what's out there and what opportunities might come from that. And then if you look underneath that that request, there's a dream. Like the, mm. what's really what's really funny about that fun about that is that. Underneath that request, there's ultimately a dream. There is a desire that the person has 
Um, and so if you can go a little bit deeper into that, what is the dream that you have? So for example, if I am always complaining that, you know, you don't write, you don't call, it takes you, it takes us weeks and weeks to get back together. Um, you know, if I come to you with that complaint, you're going to go, oh my gosh, this like, I don't want to write you and call you. You're totally a drag to hang out with right now. You're, just, you're complaining. Hmm. It's not really powerful energy. So that's the complaint. Well, the request might be instead, hey, you're gonna, I'm noticing that it takes us a while to get back to each other. I would love it if you could get back to me within 24 hours. Is that possible? And then you get to say, uh, yes, Denise, I will do that happily. Or no, that doesn't work. It's going to take three weeks. But we are now in clean uh, energy and clean relationship. I've made a clean request. You've made a clean response. And there we go. Now, hmm. If you look underneath that request, if you really want to connect with me as a human being or understand why I, why I want this so bad, if you look underneath the request, there's a dream there. And the dream is probably something in the realm of, I want to have a better working relationship. I want us to do great work together. Um, you know, I want our scheduling to be easy. There's some kind of a dream. And then the real ninja move is to look underneath that dream. And underneath the dream is often a tender agenda which is usually going to boil down to some form of, do you like me? Do I matter to you? Am I worth it? Et cetera. So, some cousin in there around self-worth. So hmm. it can be interesting as you're looking at your complaints to look at the requests, the dreams, the tender agenda that might be underneath them. Um, and as you're leading your people to look at their complaints and to follow that thread through. And then when you're innovating to look at, all right, here's the complaint. Here's the request I have. What's the dream that people have around this particular complaint? What's the dream? And then go deeper. What's the tender agenda? What is the need that's not being met that we can fill if we innovate this new product? Hmm. That's that's a great strategy. And, of course, that comes once you get to that tender request. That's kind of getting to the core human needs that um, yeah. Tony Robbins talks about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And absolutely. so. You say, well, you know, which of those is not being met in this instance and, and how, can, how can we resourcefully meet those needs for both of us? Absolutely. Absolutely. Hmm. I love that. All right. Um, what's your favourite tool or system for improving your own productivity and allowing <laughs> you to be more innovative or allowing you to show up and be intentionally energetically present? <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, okay, I have one that is so simple um, but if it does not get on this list, it doesn't happen. And that's the app Todoist. Okay, um, I'm yes. Sure, I'm sure you're, you know that one. Um, yes, I, I'm a user of Todoist. In fact, uh, my subscription runs out today, so I better renew that. Oh, well, there you go. There's, yeah. there's an angel wink. Um, <laughs> I love Todoist. My entire team is on Todoist. My team has learned to manage me through Todoist. They know that if it is not on there with details galore, it's a, it is not happening. So um, Todoist has become kind of like, you know, my phone. It's always in my hand. Mm. <laughs> and, um, and the other one is I, I really love Evernote as well, just in terms of helping me stay organized with stuff. But, but I would say Todoist, if you, made me, if you made me pick one, I'm going to say Todoist. Okay. All right. So we'll definitely link to both of those. I mean, Evernote okay. comes up from time to time. I use Evernote yeah. too, but I kind of have a love-hate relationship with Evernote. So. <laughs> I, I, we, you know what? I understand that. I understand that. I, I quietly have a love-hate relationship too, but I <laughs> but I, I more love it and I see the value. I, it's my fault. It's my user error. I, I, don't, I don't discipline myself very well on organizing it. So mm. that's, that's where the hate part comes in. <laughs> but I okay. love what it's supposed to do. Yeah. All right, so we'll definitely have links in the show notes to those things that people can check out. Now, what's the best way to keep a project on track? Mm. Best way to keep a project on track? Are you talking about if I'm working by myself or with a team? Well, either or. Well, I, uh, I am very old school. Um, I, every single week, do an inventory on either Sunday night or Monday morning, and I sit down at my desk with a piece of paper and a pen, my favorite pen, and a very awesome notepad that I like, and I jot out what my priorities are for the week, what projects, what big projects are, are you know, that I or my team are working on, and I jot out, like, where are we at and what needs to happen this week. So I, I personally like to touch. I like to touch it, write it out, look at it, and then I get a big squirt of dopamine or adrenaline or whatever it is whenever I get to check it off the list. So there is, a, um, there, there is something tangible that I enjoy with that. Mm. My team, in terms of project management, we've used a bunch of different 
project management software sets, and we have never found one that we love. Yeah. So we still, we've never found one that all of us like. And so what we do is we use Todoist to keep track of our projects, ironically, which I know that's not what it was originally intended for, but we've figured out a way to, to do it. Or maybe it is intended for that. I don't know. But I didn't think that was the original intent, but we're doing it. And then what we do is we use Google Docs for living documents. We'll have an Excel spreadsheet that kind of takes us through where things are at. We use Google Docs to, to work on things when they're live, and then we transfer everything over to Dropbox when it's done and complete, and we are really good at filing our systems there. Mm. So our it, it's it's a little caveman it's, still. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, a little cave, it's a little caveman, but it's it's what works for us. I think the best, here, here's my answer to your question. The best way to keep projects on track is whatever way it works best for your team to feel like their brains work when they're yeah. using that product, that, that, that system. Yeah, that, that's a really great answer. And I think, you know, you, you touched on something there about not having found a project management system that works. And that in part, that's why this question is there, because I, yeah. I'm still struggling to find one that actually works. And if I want to do really good distraction, I will go and research project management systems because that can keep me going for the whole day. Um, yeah. But okay. so we've, we've stuck with what we use, even though we're not what entirely you, have, use? well, we use Asana for the project management. Okay. So we're not, I'm doing to do us more on a personal level and I'm kind of a, a little bit um, unhappy that, you know, there's two different systems that I have to go into two different systems. Yeah. And, and so what I tend to do is just link um, link from Todoist out to a project. And then okay. if it's a project, it's in Asana. If it's a, an action, it, it would be in Todoist, but then project actions end up in Asana. So it's kind of not as efficient as it could be. No, and, and, and see, and here's the thing, the energy of that, my brain, I'm listening to you and I feel like i got to go take a nap because I think about <laughs> going right. back and forth, you know, so for me, and, and there are certain people, so my, my main, my, our director of people planning and programs, that's, she's like our, my, my main right arm, she loves to get into the weeds and link stuff up and do all that, all the stuff you're talking about, she loves to, I literally, my eyes glaze over, and so mm. that's another thing that um, is making sure, you know, how do you get projects done? How do you stay on track with the project? Make sure your people, make sure the team is truly paired up with the roles that they are so delighted by because she loves project management. But mm. I, our rule is literally give me just the facts, bare minimum, like set it up as much as you can for me so I don't have to think about it. And then she's magical at that. But if I think about going back and forth in links and Asana and to do a small, I literally want to go take a nap right now. It's, yeah. it's pretty amazing how the brain, you know, some of our brains expand with that stuff. Some of our brains contract. So I like yeah. to use my brain for different things. So yeah. It's good. And, and, yeah, there's great advice in that in terms of, you know, focus on what you're good at and where you add the most value and get yeah. help with the other areas. And, you know, you, typically what you enjoy the most is where you're going to be best at and add most value because that's where you're going to invest your time to improve. Yeah. We, we've I, another, another thing for this um, to serve your audience is also, you know, there's a lot of value when you're meeting with your team. If your energetic preferences, if, 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 if somebody doesn't need to be there, if there's going to be a part of the meeting that's exhausting for that person because they're not in alignment with their energetic preferences, get them out of the meeting. In fact, there's a there's a really good tool. This is not a question asked, but there's a really good tool that I will often work with, and I have a beautiful relationship with this company. But they're called Five Dynamics, and it literally is an online assessment that helps people gauge where where is their energy, like how do they prefer to process, how do they prefer to to work, and it's a really good tool for individually, but then it's brilliant for teaming. So you could put that in the show notes too, and just link to it and have people check that out. But I I have found that incredible. That's one of the reasons why I know Sandy. Um, I mean, I could have already told that intuitively that we were a good fit, but when I pair our profiles up together, we are a perfect fit with the way our brains like to process things. Mm. So that could, be, that could be a fun tool for your people. Okay. I'll take a yeah. look at that and we'll Absolutely. link to that in the show notes as well. All right. Well, so the number five question, what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves? Mm, the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves, be themselves. <laughs> Really? Yeah. I, I mean, really, I know that's, that may be too simple and not brilliant enough for this question, but honestly, that's the way that you differentiate yourself is you be 100% yourself. And oh, by the way, 100% you be present. Mm. You be intentional. You work on your, you like, you, you do your IEP. 
You show up as yourself, totally authentically. You're present so that you know how to respond to things. And also, here's the thing. From a state of presence, think about somebody that you know that is incredibly present. And when you're with them, you can feel them. And the space that they're holding is solid. You feel that. That's Mm -hmm. a big differentiator. I feel like that is something that is um, a very special art that we can easily get away with when we're or get away from when we're running around so fast. So honestly, differentiation, I think the way to differentiate is you be 100% authentically who you are and you be really present with people Hmm. and then you're different. Yeah, that's great advice. Now, you know, you said be themselves might not be the sexiest or high-tech answer, but it's the one that comes up most often. And really, really, yeah. if um, to differentiate, you know, no, nobody's more different to everybody else than you are. <laughs> so, it's true. Well, and, yeah. and here's and the one caveat I would add to that. I, I'm glad you just gave that back to me because the one thing I would add to that is be yourself. But you can also authentically be a really mean, unkind person with a lot of negative impact. So (laughs) be yourself and also have the positive intention to serve and contribute. So if I can be myself and do everything I can to, again, be present, but Mm. also serve and love and be contributory to people around me and love myself, oh, by the way, because that's a huge part of being myself. If I can love myself, I now have more capacity to love the people around me. That's a differentiator. I don't yeah. want to just be myself if I'm a jerk and I don't care about myself. <laughs> I don't care about you guys. Like, that's great. Now we're going to have a bunch of people running around going, well, she said I could, you know, and I yeah, literally right. have had people come to me with this work and go, well, what about me? I'm an authentic jerk. Like I feel <laughs> people. And I, I literally had a guy say to me at a conference a couple of years ago, Anise, I, you know, I'm an authentic, you talk about authenticity. I'm an authentic jerk. So what do you think about that? And I went, well, does it work for you? And he goes, well, yeah, I throw phones at my people. And they do what I say. And I said, well, do they want to follow you or do they have to follow you? And he's like, well, they have to because I give them their jobs. Yeah. So I said, well, is that the kind of leader you want to be? And he's like, yeah, it is. I said, cool. This work is not for you. You're good. Now, a year later, that company was not on the list anymore of the award winners. So I don't know what happened to that company. But my point is you can be authentic and be yourself and be a really, really bad leader. So if mm. you want to have impact and positive impact on the planet and then your company and everything, be yourself and do the work that you need to do so that you are positively impacting the people around you. And that starts with intention. Yeah. Well, I like what you said there early in that conversation around loving yourself and and because I think, you know, some, a leader who throws phones at people, I mean, that must be pretty ordinary to work there. Um, he, I mean, that says a lot about how he feels about himself. And Absolutely. So, you know, that being comfortable in your own skin and then yeah. you can be yourself and, and show up with, you know, the – intention and energy and presence that we've talked about today and yeah. and make positive changes in the world I think so. yeah I mean and, yeah. and I think for that I think for that gentleman like I actually when he said that to me I, my experience was I had a lot of compassion for him because I'm mm. thinking wow what what is it what is it to be like what, what does that got to feel like to be somebody who has to throw phones at people to get attention and that that's what you think your leadership power is because to me you know, of course, that's leading through force. So my wish for him would have been, and, and I tried to show this with him, but he, he, he wasn't really crazy about my thinking on this. <laughs> but, you know, my wish for him would have been, instead of throwing phones at people and leading through force, what is it to take a deep breath to see the human beings that are following you, that are trusting you with their careers and giving you their time, attention, and, and creativity? What is it to be with those people and actually be an invitation for them to want to follow you. Like what, it, what, what changes when you shift into that energetic state versus I got to throw phones at my people because I'm panicking right now because I'm whatever else is, whatever is going on. I don't, I don't want to presume to know what was going on in his mm. head, but that, that's where I look with that. It's like, that's leadership by force. If you can, cho- you can choose in a moment to shift your state from being leading by force to leading by invitation. And all it takes is a breath and a decision to step back and have a better intentional energetic presence. That's it. Hmm. All right. So, yeah, yeah. So, what's what's the future for you then, and for the I, IEP technology? And is there something new coming out? I think were you planning a new book? Yeah. Hmm. Yes. So, so I have um, I have two 
but we have, there's three, there's three books. One of them um, we're getting ready to, I think, release by the end of the summer. We're, we're just tidying up some stuff on that. The other one, um, we're, it, 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 two, there's, there's a couple new books coming out. Um, and that, I guess that's, that's what I should say about that right now. But yes, for sure. Mm. And then the other thing, you know, so my attention is there a lot right now, but the other piece is, um, is stewardship. So a couple of years ago, I started training people to teach this work in their own organizations um, so that we could really truly scale this in a way that has integrity and um, has people bring it to their companies and make the content theirs internally with their own culture. So we have a stewardship model. And so stewardship is where I basically train people and certify them in being able to lead this body of work, the half day version of it, and they take it back to their companies or their industries or what, you know, whatever. And one of our really exciting things right now is we've just finished doing our first education cohort. So we have eight stewards that are going to be taking this work to the principals and teachers of their entire school district, and then ultimately to the kids in that district. And so that's, that's some fun ripple impact. So we're working on a lot more of that. So we've got stewards in healthcare, stewards in education, stewards in design, stewards in hospitality, and then of course stewards in corporate culture. So um, we're, we're, we've just done a couple of leapfrogs and growing it. We've been prototyping it for a couple of years. It's a proven business model now. It works. We've got the training down tight. And so now we're going to be really starting to amplify that over the next couple of years. And um, that will help us reach more people as, um, as, we, as we continue to scale this business. Mm, so that's, I'm excited about that. For sure. Yeah, exciting times. And, and I like the way you're developing it in a way that there are people that are specialists in particular industry niches. Yeah, it's it's been a really interesting thing because what we've found is that when you're teaching intentional energetic presence, you really have to be walking your talk. You really have to be practicing the work. So we found that it wasn't, it's not just like a typical train the trainer where you come for four days and you learn how to teach, you know, two plus two is four and here's how you do this method. And there's actually a a real immersion that needs to happen for these people teaching this content where they're really practicing it in their own lives and in their own leadership and they're trying it on and they're creating their own examples and stories. And then after about a year, they start going out and sharing it and then they get to customize it really beautifully to their industry. So it's, it's been, it's been lovely to watch. It's been a ton of um, blood, sweat and tears. Um, and I'm excited because I think we're I think we're in a really good place with it now. So it's um, it's it's kind of creating. It's got a life of its own now. It's it's now it's it's way bigger than me. I'm just hmm. I now I'm just here to steward it in different ways. Yeah. So I feel grateful for that. Great. Well, we look forward to keeping track of how that progresses and also the new books coming out. Thank you. I know that was so ambiguous the way I said that. I, that, that. You're catching me on a day where we literally have had three different meetings about the three different books, and we've decided to table one because I don't want to be doing two books at the same time. One okay. is done. Yeah. So that's where you're catching me. <laughs> my, brain is still, my brain is still racing from that particular conversation, so we'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> well, what's the number one piece of advice you'd give to any business owner who wants to be a leader in innovation and in productivity? Mm. Start, start a morning ritual. Start a morning ritual that sets the tone for your entire day where you claim for the first five minutes, nine minutes, 30 minutes, whatever it is that you feel great in, you claim your first chunk of the day to uh, get present, to meditate or journal, to breathe, to dance, to do whatever, to do whatever it is that will help you set your tone without anybody else's emails, texts, phone calls, agendas, without the rest of the world and the news with, you know, just give yourself a morning, the gift of a morning ritual for your own self care. So you can claim your day and set the tone. And if you do that and you set your intentions, you take care of yourself, that will, that will change your life. Mm. Yeah, or, I, can, I don't want to change. I don't want to change anybody's life. Actually, that will enhance your life. It, you guys it change. Enhance, yeah. yeah, it'll enhance your yeah. life. We don't need to change your life, but it'll 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 enrich and it will give you. We have been doing this for so many years, and we've done so many experiments with this, and we find that that is like one of the number one things that you start an authentic morning ritual, not the ritual that I just gave you, but something that really feels mm. congruent for you, where well, you go, I, yeah. okay, yeah. I I can definitely attest to that. So I have, um, I'm a passionate keen bike rider that a lot of my audience would know and mm. my normal morning ritual is that I get up have a glass of water 
get into my bike gear, get out for an hour on the bike, um, and and then I get back and shower and get ready breakfast, and then I'm ready for work now. And I've got a little note on my pin board here saying that every day that you cycle is a good day. So Mm. the last few days I haven't done it, and, and sometimes I don't go out on the bike in the morning, and it the day is different. It just feels mm-hmm. as though there's something missing. Yeah, I, I can relate for sure. Mm. I can relate. So I think, so I think it's, you know, that would be my offer is everybody to find what is their version of that that mm. makes them feel like they're in their body and they're in their spirit and their mind and they own their day. What, what is their version of that? And yeah. I also find that it changes, you know, as soon as I think I've got my quote unquote routine or ritual, then, then my, my body, my spirit, whatever, has outgrown it, and I'm ready for something different. So mm. just pay attention. Just pay attention. Mm. Great advice. Well, mm-hmm. thank you, Anise. This has mm. been really terrific. I've really enjoyed this. Where can people reach out to you and say thank you? Oh, they can find me. Uh, AniseCavanaugh.com is our main website right now. Um, they can also, you know, we didn't talk about virtual, but I know you'd mentioned virtual. I, what no, I, what I want to offer, with, I know, right? We just got into everything else, yeah, which yeah. is <laughs> fun. I love it. Um, but just, just, just since you brought it up, they, they, if they go to IEP.io, so if you go to IEP.io, that will get them into our system, which unlocks a bunch of different tools. So one of the tools is the IEP sheet, which has got the, you know, an intentional energetic setting, you know, in, intentional it's IEP sheet for setting your intentions and really using this methodology. There's a quick start kit in there. There's also a virtual presence guide. So if they go, they can download some of those tools. And what I will say about virtual and online stuff, everything we're talking about applies. To me, it is no different. To me, if you and I are right here on this call, the way that I am being present with you, my level of intentionality, um, my energy, all of it, is no different than if we were face to face. I I could get away with doing this with you in my pajamas or, you know, just after a workout or whatever. I don't have to worry about how I quote unquote look because you can't see me. However, I still, I still get dressed up. Like I still, to me, it just doesn't matter. Our IEP is operating all the time, whether we are on the other side of the world or whether we're one foot away from each other. Um, The other place from a virtual standpoint to pay attention to is when you are on um, you know, when you are on Skype or Zoom or whatever and you're doing virtual meetings, really pay attention to the backdrop and what it is that people are seeing and having to work around visually. And I know that sounds really obvious, but it, it, I think it's something that we can take for granted and forget about. But there is a way, the, the people who are watching you, they'll get, one, distracted by your dirty socks that are hanging out in the back of your chair, or they're they're having to process extra information. So make your background, make your environmental energy as pleasant as possible to the people who are on those platforms with you. So Hmm. things like that, you know, being five minutes early to make sure that all the logistics work from a virtual standpoint. Um, We've had people who their entire company is virtual, and so one of the ways that they build culture and they um, stay connected is they'll have pizza parties and they will literally have a pizza sent to every single person's house at the same time, pizza and beer, and then they'll get on Skype or Zoom or whatever and they'll have this big, huge party and they're all eating pizza and beer and that is their bonding and they're all over the world or Mm. all over the country, not all over the world. They're all over the country and they're doing that. So just getting creative. To me, I love having my, my whole team's virtual. My team's in Boston, Colorado, Chicago. I, don't, I, I have one person in California um, who doesn't live anywhere close to me. So our entire team is virtual. It's been that way forever. I did have a team that was close to me for a couple of years. Um, I, you know, as much as I love, we get together once a year. I have them all come to my house. We do a retreat here. We're doing this later in June. I love that. I love to hug them. I love to touch them. I love to see their faces. But... The virtual works just fine, but we pay attention to the same. We treat the same agreements and rules and our IEP the same as if we were sitting next to each other every day. Mm, that's great advice. So, and thank, that and thank, helpful? Yeah. Yeah, and thanks for bringing me back to that. So, oh, I, of course. I, I guess one of the things that I had intended to explore and, um, you know, we, we have been going for quite some time, so maybe we need to get you back on the podcast is in terms of when you're online, not live with somebody, but when you're um, – writing articles, um, posting to the social media and those sort of things. How does the, how do you bring this 
concept of intentional energetic presence into that space. That was yeah. that was the thing I wanted to explore, but it's possibly a, a big topic. <laughs> Well, I, well, gosh, that's so funny. You're going, so I misunderstood what you meant by online. So, well, I hope, I hope, I hope what I, did, I shared was helpful. <laughs> no, it, it was very valuable, okay. and I think I, I really like the idea of the uh, the uh, remote <laughs> or yeah, um, yeah. Distri- I call it distributed teams, the um, remote yeah. thing. So, so the distributed um, pizza and beer party. I love that idea. <laughs> it's, I know, I do too. So, so to to answer your so the bullet point for the question you just asked, and I'm happy to come back on and talk more about it. But basically, every action you're doing, virtual, online, Twitter, you're going to tweet something, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. You want to check in with your intentions, your energy, and your presence. And and even I believe if my energetic presence is really crabby and I'm in a bad mood, I'm in a state of blame. I'm not going to go post something online. People will feel the energy. Even if I pretend like, hey there, hi there, hello there, everything is going so great, and I'm not in a good energetic state, I believe that that gets communicated through Twitter or through whatever. So Hmm. just check everything you're doing. When you're writing an article, you're writing marketing copy, you're going to do social media, what what is your intention? What is the energy you're bringing to that activity and to the people who are going to receive it, and how present are you in doing it? Hmm. And that's it. It's, it's, it, to me, again, it, it doesn't, I, I see the world through that lens now. It's like, what is my intention? What's my energy? What's my presence? Is it going to contribute to things going better in the world? Or is it contribute to things going worse? Like, what is what I'm about to do going to help expand energy and make people feel happier and contribute to the light? Or is what I'm about to do going to contract, make things heavier and make things worse? And then I get to make my choice on what I do from that place. And, you know, hopefully it's towards the light mm. yeah that's great advice I, I have this um belief that people treat online differently and they think it's different but it's actually not um it's a different medium yes and mm-hmm. there are some some limitations for online compared to being in the same room with somebody and and seeing them um, mm-hmm. and there's a continuum like you talked about the example of being on zoom calls or skype calls yeah. Um, where you can see people and you can have that virtual beer and pizza party, but um, writing articles or posting to Twitter is, doesn't have that ability, although there's some yeah. neat things that people do. But I think, uh, you know, what you've just said really rings true. It, it's no different when you interact on those things because it's all about building relationships with people and contributing. Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, I know, I know Brene Brown talks a lot about um, dehumanizing and, I, you know, I've been paying attention to her work a lot, especially with everything that's going on um, in the world, and just like the, the conf- just conflict and everything. But, but one thing that I would say is this, is you're online, you can't see the person you're writing to, you don't know them. You're right, it's the Wild West, people can say whatever they want, mm-hmm. and they're never going to be found, they're hiding out in the basement of their you know, like what, like I don't want, I don't want to, I don't want to go down a dark path here, but anyway, <laughs> they're hiding out behind some avatar and it is really easy to say terrible things about people online. The invitation I have for all of us is to just consider before I post anything to consider the human being that is on the other side of that's going to be receiving that tweet or that Facebook or whatever, that article. It's like, there's a human being, there are human beings mm. who have mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters who have their worries, who have kids, who are trying their best to do the best of their career, who are trying to have positive impact. They're human beings. And so I think um, that is something that always helps me kind of slow my roll if I'm feeling irritated about something is to just, continue, is just to consider the human being that I'm about to communicate with via email or tweet or whatever and to give a little bit of love for that. And I know that is, you know, a very, um, maybe that's a very fairyland pixie dust way to think about it, but I actually feel that that is, I, I just feel it's very, very important. So not everybody will do it, and it's fine. And so then if you're, if you're the recipient of it, um, then there's the remembering of being self-kind and then also bubbling up so that you don't take mm. that on and let that destroy you. That's another yeah. element of this, you know, which is a whole other conversation. Yeah, we'll make it mean something that it doesn't necessarily mean. And, of course, when it's just written words on a page, then you don't get a lot of the nuances that are behind that, like body language or, yeah. you know, if somebody's being 
facetious or tongue in cheek with a comment or yeah. whether it's you know whether they're being genuinely nasty so you you know don't oh make it, don't necessarily make it mean the worst oh I, I love it that you just said that because it's, I mean it's true with text too I mean I you know I I, I can't you know it's, you try dating someone or having a relationship with someone over time it's impossible like you just can't you, you cannot understand what the tone of voice is so that's the other thing is that if you're receiving stuff and you're feeling like it's negative or it's harsh or whatever, don't make any assumptions around it because mm. they might have just been really quickly going through their email and there's nothing personal in it. So we got to watch from both sides. We want to watch our impact on what we're putting out there, and then we want to watch our impact on how we're receiving stuff or what we're making up about it. It, mm. it takes it, both sides, 100%, 100%, all of us got to be paying attention to how, how are we putting stuff out and how are we receiving it, and are we doing it all in a way – that is expansive and present and actually helps things go better, or we do it in a way that's creating more resistance in the world. That's it. Okay. Easier right. said than well, done. It is, yes. So, and I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I try to be aware of these things. Yeah. All right. Well, finally then, who would you like me to interview on a future Nova Buzz podcast and why? Oh, you know, um, I think you could interview Marissa Smith. Uh, Marissa Smith. I think it's Marissa Smith. Oh, gosh, it might be marissasmith.com or .net. I can't remember right this minute. Um, Marissa Smith, she is an entrepreneur. She's an EOS implementer. Um, I adore her. She's just got a really nice way of thinking about um, business and setting up systems and all that good stuff. I don't know. Do you guys ever do anything with EOS people? Are you familiar uh, with EOS, Entrepreneurial no. Operating System? Uh, no, I'm not. Well, I've heard of it, but I'm not familiar with it. But, yeah, it sounds yeah. fascinating, though. Yeah, Marissa Smith, um, Gino Wickman. Um, I personally do not know him, but he is the founder of that company. And oh, okay, yeah, really the, yeah. With so I've read traction. traction. Yeah, I've read his book. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. So they, yeah. so and so Marissa is a an implementer of that body of work, and um, she's also come to a lot of our events, and um, I've known her for years. And um, she could be really. She's the first person that pops into my mind. She could be fun. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, um, we might get you to introduce us to Marissa, and if she sure. is listening to this, Marissa, we'll send you an invite courtesy of Anise Kavanagh. Oh, good. Good, good, good. All right. Well, thank you so much. Yes. Yeah, so, well, thanks, Anise. Thanks for sharing your insights with us today. It's been fun. Um, we've kind of gone off on different tangents, but I think it's all, <laughs> all been within the context of being intentionally, energetically present and, and how that impacts on our leadership skills. So, I wish you all the best for the future and for your new book launch launch or launches and let's keep in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. All right, bye-bye. Bye. I hope you got a lot from that interview with Anise and will apply those lessons of intentional energetic presence in all you do. I think there are some very powerful suggestions there. All the ideas and tips that Anise shared with us can be found at innovabiz.co forward slash Anise Kavanagh. That is A-N-E-S-E for Anise, C-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H. A-N-E-S-E-C-A-V-A-N-A-U-G-H. All lowercase, all one word, innovabiz.co forward slash Anise Kavanagh. You'll also find contact information for getting in touch with Anise there and details of her book. Anise suggests that I interview Marissa Smith from 87 Plus on a future Innova Buzz podcast. So Marissa, keep an eye on your inbox for an invitation from us to the Innova Buzz podcast, courtesy of Anise Kavanagh. Stay connected. Head on over to iTunes or Stitcher or Pocket Casts and subscribe to the Innova Buzz podcast so you make sure you'll never miss another episode. We'd also love you to leave us a review because what you think matters. Take some of the ideas you've heard today and apply them in your business. Any thoughts, ideas, suggestions or questions, share them in the comments below the blog post. And remember... If you want to get better marketing results than you ever have, join our fantastic LinkedIn community at the Transformational Marketing Academy. All you have to do is go to innovabiz.co forward slash TMAC. It's free to join. Hope to see you there soon. Until next time, I'm Jürgen Strauss from Innovabiz. Remember... 
to be awesome and keep innovating. <laughs>